We've got Howard Patterson. Correct. And uh, you, uh, I don't know, I, I call you a fish biologist. Is that your title? I, or? I'm not a fish biologist. Uh, I, I have a master's in environmental management from Portland State. And uh, so I'm more of a generalist. Uh, my, the specific thing I followed was invertebrates. I, uh, I do biomonitoring, which is using, uh, analyzing the species of, of invertebrates that are in the water to see whether there are sensitive or, in, or, uh, or insensitive ones there. So you know, some, some insects will die easily with poisons or with uh, changes in temperature, and so you can, you can use that to, to analyze the water. But, but in general, uh, water quality is, is what I've studied. Right. And so when I heard that fluoridation was coming up, I didn't have strong feelings about it one way or another. I use fluoride toothpaste. It actually has been effective in, in uh, arresting the tooth decay I had as a youth, you know. Uh, but it seemed, you know, fluoride is a very potent toxin, and so I started to research it and see what was going on. My first reaction was, well, it, it doesn't seem like it's that good an idea to just pour this uh, highly toxic material into the environment without seeing whether it's going to have any effect or not. Mm -hmm. And uh, so what I learned is that, uh, in fact, fluoride is, is an industrial pollutant. It's, uh, it was one of the first industrial pollutants to be identified as the you know, people were, were getting sick and dying, animals were dying in like 1850. And they finally pinned that down to fluoride being released from uh, largely metal smelting uh, creates a lot of fluoride, releases a lot of fluoride. Mm. It, was, it was just being released directly into it's the atmosphere. In, it's in the ore then. And, exactly. Yeah. And so in Europe, they started to build tall smokestacks so that the fluoride would go further east and then not kill their cows, it would kill somebody else's cows, so it was okay. Go in someone's watershed, exactly. two watersheds over. Exactly, that was the plan. But uh, it turns out that, uh, so w one of the things that uh, fluoride defenders say is, is that, well, it, it's safe in low concentrations, and you can see that in the ocean, uh, fluoride, the natural concentration of fluoride is about 1.4 Parts per million is the is the measurement we usually use. Uh, sometimes people say milliga milligrams per liter. It's the same, uh, the same the same number can have either uh, suffix. They're interchangeable. They're interchangeable. quantities. Yeah. Yeah. So about 1.4 is on in uh, in seawater is about the the uh, the background level. So uh, that's higher than than most fluoridated water. So they say, well, then, so that's, it's obvious that it's not harmful to fish. But the thing is that the saltwater and freshwater environment are very different. Totally different, And right. salmon are this incredibly heroic animal that can live in saltwater. Yeah. They, they, they grow up in freshwater, they live in saltwater, they come back, and steelhead go back and forth. Uh, and they have to change their body chemistry significantly each time they go from salt to fresh or fresh to salt. Because when you're in saltwater, the water that you're in, the, the medium, is saltier than the inside of your body. So you have to pump salts out. So if there's fluoride, fluoride is, is basically a salt. There's uh, you know, like sodium chloride is, is table salt. It's sodium and chlorine. Uh, there's a lot of sodium, a lot of chlorine in seawater. There's some fluorine in seawater too. Uh, so the, the body of a fish in salt water will pump all of, that, all of those salts out of its body. So not a problem. But in fresh water, the body is much saltier than the surrounding water. And so they have to pump they salt they absorb in. It, yeah. And uh, a, f a salmon goes through uh, two and a half times its body volume per hour in water, just pumping it in through its gills. Uh, and it, it brings in sodium and then chlorine follows. And so that's how they, that how they maintain their salt balance. But if there's fluorine in the water, that follows too, because it, it's also a negative ion like the chlorine is it's a smaller molecule so it's more transportable. So if there's fluorine in the water, it will be uh, pumped into the fish as well. Uh, now we know from a, a lot of studies, uh, the thing about this is there's not really a lot of, of study that's been done and that's surprising and a little suspicious. There have not been a lot of really good studies. Especially uh, here where we're trying to save our salmon. Exactly. <laughs> now a lot of study has been done in, in the sea with uh, like in the aquaculture industry to see whether fluoride is being is harmful to fish and whether it's being pumped into fish in the ocean and it, and it isn't particularly. Uh, but uh, what research has been done on freshwater fish and especially freshwater salmon uh, and also freshwater invertebrates has been uh, has, has indicated that they are more sensitive than uh, than than other studies might suggest than the than the aqua than the the marine studies would suggest. So. There were a, a, a series of studies done through the 80s and 90s. Uh, they determined that 
floor, well, they, they found, uh, there were some, there were some uh, laboratory scientists who found what levels of fluoride, fluoride are poisonous to different fish. And they found uh, various levels for various fish and various invertebrates. They found, they, they used rainbow trout as the experimentation medium because they're easy to deal with. Mm -hmm. And they found about 3.5 parts per million would kill half the fish. So they said, okay, 3.5, that's, that's, we think of that as the lethal dose. That's about uh, an order of magnitude more. Or, well, it's, it's actually about twice, now as I think about it, that's about twice the level that we're talking about uh, as the maximum level for fluoridated water. It's about 1.7 is the range that is suggested is between, I'm sorry, 1.7 and 1.2. So, uh, so it's, it's a little more than twice the level. But uh, they discovered that fluoride is more toxic at uh, higher temperatures and less toxic at lower temperatures. It, it takes less fluorine to kill a fish in cold water than it does in warm water. No, I said that backwards. You said it's it backwards, less water, yeah. Less fluorine in warm water than it does in cold water. So mm -hmm. cold water helps protect them from, from chlorine. They also found that uh, soft water is, because there are, if, if hard water protects the fish from fluorine, if there is a lot of, of other minerals, especially calcium and, uh, and, and chlorine in the water, then it takes more fluorine to kill the fish than if, if the water is soft. So our water in the Northwest is extremely soft. So, and, and with global warming, it's starting to warm up some. So those two factors mean that the fish are likely to be more sensitive than they were. Mm -hmm. There was a study done in 1990 where uh, he looked at those two earlier studies and calculated that the safe level for rainbow trout would be about 0.2 parts per million. Uh, now, the best study that's been done on fluorine, salmon, and the waters of the Northwest uh, was done by two uh, NOAA scientists in uh, the late 80s. Actually, it went all, th all through the 80s. That was the John Day study? It is uh, the John Day study. Dan Kayer and Day were the, mm -hmm. were the scientists. And uh, they had just uh, started tagging salmon with electronic tags and following them as they migrated up the Columbia. And they found that at John Day, they were taking much longer to go through the dam to go up the, the fish ladder mm -hmm. than, they, than they had been. And like, I guess 1982, I think, was the year. Instead of taking a day to go through, they were taking a week to go through. And uh, uh, mortality had greatly increased. About half the, the salmon were dying. They just they weren't making it up. And so they started uh, studying this to find out, could it be turbidity? Could it be temperature? Could it be, uh, and what kind of pollutants could it be? Could it be pesticides? And the thing that they found uh, seemed to be responsible was fluoride. And the, the levels were about 0.5 parts per million. Where and was, that was enough to keep them from going up the fish. Where was that said, from? Sorry, we don't want to do it. And uh, there was a smelter, an aluminum smelter that had just opened. Oh. And so yeah. they, uh, they went after the aluminum smelting. People told them to dispose of the fluoride, fluoride in a different way. The levels went down and uh, the population of salmon went back up. Their mortality dropped down to 5% to, um, instead of 50%. And it was back to taking a day to go through the, the mm. dam again. So, uh, as a, as a, a laboratory study, they went to a, a creek. The name escapes me momentarily. In Washington, that had two separate flumes, and they would randomly select one or the other to put fluoride in one and not put it in the other, and uh, and try different doses. And they found that both coho and chinook would avoid fluoride down to 0.2 parts per million. And, uh, and there was, there was definitely was really clear evidence. This is 1989. Since then, there really haven't been any studies done. And, and you would think this is indicative enough that, that people would look at all sorts of different aspects of this relationship. Um, but it hasn't happened. And part of the reason is, I think, because the fluoride industry has done such a great job of uh, painting anyone who opposes fluoride with the loony brush, uh, people are really afraid. Mm -hmm. Scientists are afraid to stick their well, necks. Some out. have lost their jobs and their standing. Exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, this is really good data that Dan Kayer and Day got. It's really clear. Uh, but I'd like to know a lot more. One of the things I'd like to know is what effect does at at what kind of dosage 
dosages does fluoride affect juvenile salmon? Because while we know that it affects the migration of adult salmon, uh, but they aren't actually eating uh, anything when once they come once they come up into the water to to uh, to breed, right. they don't eat. Just the but spawning, juveniles yeah. are are living there eating insects that live in the fluoridated water, and uh, there is very clear evidence that uh, that invertebrates do accumulate fluoride mm -hmm. in their exoskeletons, uh, and it does bioaccumulate from one trophic level to the, to the next, that as you go up the food chain, fluoride ac accumulates more and more in the, in the exoskeletons of invertebrates and in the bones and teeth of vertebrates. And uh, it's, it has been suggested uh, that the reason that there's, it's, a, it's a response of the body to fluoride poisoning, that the body goes, well, we can't have this fluoride going around with our blood. It's, going to, it's, it's screwing up all these enzymatic rea reactions and so forth, so we'll just store it in the bones. They can eliminate it to some degree, but mostly it gets stored in the bones and teeth. Uh, and as we know, fluorosis is one of the, the, uh, the results of that. And uh, the other health effects that are implied uh, involving the skeleton are that there seem to be problems with fractures and so forth. Uh, not, there hasn't been very much research done on that either. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I was recently was hearing about this, and uh, since this has been done since 1945, mm -hmm. and some of the children, you know, myself included, that have been taking in cities that did this, uh, how about when they're 60s? I mean, does exactly. this have something to do with, with uh, the, so many elderly people getting broken bones so easily when they fall? It certainly could. It certainly and could. There's been and no studies on it. There, not, there have been a few. But ah. nothing, nothing extensive. And this is the, uh, the so there's the York University study in 2000 of uh, the British uh, National Health, uh, it's, it's the Institute of National Health, I think, National Health Institute, uh, funded a study. They said uh, the York University look at all the research there is and tell us what whether fluoridation works and whether it's safe, and. Uh, the mayor has quoted that study as one of the reasons that he made the decision to fluoridate the water. But in fact, uh, the people who made the study, after seeing how people were misquoting it, they put out a, a document in 2003, I think, saying, okay, we ask that decision makers read the study more carefully before making any decisions because we, first of all, yes, we found some evidence that, it, that fluoridation is effective, but all, there were no good studies. We also found all sorts of evidence that, uh, that there are health effects to the, to the kidneys, to the bones, that there are problems with the nervous system, with the brain, uh, across the board, uh, bladder cancer, but all of the data is poor. We don't have any good studies, and all of these studies should be done before we proclaim it safe, and more studies should be done before we proclaim it effective. Mm -hmm. And they said doing more bad studies doesn't actually help. They were very clear about that. <laughs> doing, so, there, so there is a very good study being done right now, an ongoing study funded by uh, the uh, national, I'm very bad at, at acronyms. Uh, oh, there's the, a lot of them too. <laughs> yeah, there really are. Uh, yeah, the, uh, the national health, it's not called the National Health Service here, uh, but... They're funding a study that's being done in Iowa. It's, it's known as the Iowa Fluoride Study, and it's an ongoing study. Um, there was their first report came out in 2009. Uh, they'd been ongoing for about five years, uh, and it's still going. Uh, and they found there is no correlation between fluoride ingestion and tooth decay. That they aren't looking. At, that most of the studies are well. These people live in an area that's been fluoridated, and these people don't, so we'll assume these people are getting, are ingesting fluoride, and it seems to be helping. But this actually looks at the amount of fluoride ingested by these children in the study, and finds that there is no correlation between how much fluoride they take in and how much tooth decay they have. There, is, there isn't a relationship. They did find a correlation between fluorosis between the damage to the teeth mm. and fluoride, that the more fluoride they ingested, really? the worse their fluorosis was. So that study's still going on, but that's an actually really high quality study. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you've mentioned the word funding a few times, and uh, I think the funding is exactly why yeah. these studies aren't being done. It really is. Because they're not being funded. And the, People the earliest get... research that showed it was safe was all funded by Alcoa, the, the aluminum company, mm. who had, well, they, 
there, uh, there's the Ketteridge Lab at the University of Cincinnati that they funded. Uh, before the idea of fluoridation came out, they were getting lawsuits uh, very frequently by people who were saying, we live next to a fluoride plant and uh, our bones are breaking, our children are, are sick, the, our animals are dying, we know whatever this is, and, and they were uh, not happy about having to pay these lawsuits. So they funded a study and they, they said, prove that it's safe is kind of what it's, that we need a study Find a way that to people can safe. use yeah. in, for lawsuits to show that it's safe, and that's what kind of what it said in the introduction to the studies. And then uh, the idea of fluoridation comes up. Uh, the tests are done at the Mellon Labs in Pittsburgh, uh, funded by Andrew Mellon, the uh, president of Alcoa, and or named after him, and funded by Alcoa. Uh, they did some rat tests, said this proves it, it's safe, and uh, the, they started some long-term studies, but before any of the studies were done, the National Health Department said, okay, it's great, let's go for it, let's, let's uh, promote this everywhere. And, they, and, and the, that's been the quality of health study that's gone all along, is, is we started a study, we think it looks good, uh, that's good enough for us. And it's, it's really, at this point, not good enough. We're, we're spending so many millions on trying to, uh, to renew and resuscitate our salmon populations, which are so threatened by so many different factors, the idea of taking this industrial toxin in however low concentrations and putting it into uh, our water, our drinking water is the finest water supply in the nation and one of the best in the world. It's uh, the, the Bull Run uh, aquifer is this wonderful uh, resource that our uh, predecessors created for us. Mm -hmm. And the idea of saying, well, that's not bad, but let's pour some of this stuff in it because mm -hmm. of the children, because of the poor children and their teeth. But we, uh, the best evidence is showing there isn't a good relationship between uh, decay and aquatic fluoridation. And as we know, about 1% of the water that goes through a city is drunk by the people, and the other 99% goes out into the environment. Mm -hmm. uh, so not only are we giving the population fluoride whether they want it or not, but we're giving the entire environment. Uh, and the, well, as I was saying before, one of the studies I'd like to see happen, which no one of course has done because there's no funding for it, uh, is with juvenile salmon, how do they react to uh, fluoride in the water column itself? And how do they react to eating uh, mm -hmm. insects that have fluoride in their bodies? And uh, in particular, the, the web spinning caddisflies which are a very common uh, aquatic insect in throughout the, our whole watershed. It's one of the main foods of one salmon. It is one of the main food supplies of salmon. Mm -hmm. And they are extremely sensitive to, uh, to fluoride. They're also, that, that, that uh, family in particular, the hydrocycids, are, uh, are sensitive to fluoride at levels of about 0.2 as well. So that 0.2 threshold seems to be really important. Um, we know that the Tualatin River uh, was running at about 0.5 uh, for quite a while into the in, into uh, recent years. Was that from like pesticides? Uh, from uh, I believe there was some kind of uh, industrial work going on mm. upstream. Uh, I'm not sure whether they ever pinned that one down. Uh, I have calls in to a number of people I know who who have the the better data data, and I haven't heard back yet. Um, mm -hmm. My one one of my professors at uh, PSU works at DEQ, and I asked him about what the current fluoride levels are, and he's He's trying to dig that information up. So there, there is a background level of fluoride in our water. There is. That's, that's over and above the, the fluoride they're going to put into the water. With the Tualatin, that is the case. Uh, we, that we know the Tualatin is already at a higher level than the threshold that's suggested, and they're trying to establish uh, to reestablish a salmon fishery there. Uh, I don't know what the levels in Johnson Creek are, but we are getting uh, coho up you know, pretty far up into the watershed in Johnson Creek now. Um, but having those salmon then have to go through the gauntlet mm -hmm. of, uh, of fluoride does, doesn't make any sense. The other thing is there is research that shows that sewage systems concentrate fluoride. So if it comes in at 0.1 parts per million, it may go out at 0 0.3, 0 0.4, 0 0.5, or even more. Uh, there was a study done, it was Masuda, I think in the early 90s, where he looked at cities all over the Northwest, Canada and 
uh, Washington, I think. I don't, I don't know if he did any studies in, in Oregon specifically. But he found that this was the case in uh, city after city, that the sewage, the, the mechanics of sewage systems are such that they concentrate fluoride. So however much we're putting in the drinking water, we may be even putting more into the river after mm -hmm. it goes through the sewage plant. I'm also thinking that uh, we're down to like four minutes here, but but it seems to me that with all the uh, the pesticide use and and the uh, uh, chemical fertilizers use up and down the Willamette Valley, up and down the uh, the uh, uh, Columbia River, all the way up into Canada with their with the PCBs, or whatever they're going uh -huh. on with some of the things yeah, yeah. up there, uh, there must be some fluoride runoff from the from some of that as well. Uh Actually, phosphate fertilizer production is one of the main sources well, of fluoride at from. this point. Right. So the thing is, the way that chemical regulation works in our country is that uh, there are about 8,000 new chemicals created every year and released into the environment. And it's the government's responsibility to test those for safety and ban them or not. Mm. Um, industry has no responsibility to do so. So. Uh, the government's vastly outfunded and outmatched in this. There are, I don't remember the number, but it's about 280 uh, chemicals that have been banned versus 8,000 a year. Mm -hmm. And with any, it, it's very difficult to do chemical studies because you have to try different dosages for each chemical uh, with populations of each animal you're testing. But if you're testing two chemicals, those chemicals may interact, so you have to, to test different concentrations Completely of both those segment chemicals. segment everything. Exactly. Yeah. You try three chemicals, the, the combinations are even more complex. So mm -hmm. to, to take 8,000 new chemicals a year, it's, you know, it's, it's just beyond testability. Uh, so we don't know uh, what effect fluorine, fluorine specifically will have on all the other uh, poisons and, and pollutants. We do know some. We know that uh, aluminum is taken up. Uh, to a greater degree in the presence of fluoride in fish and uh, and some other organisms. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just, it seems to me that uh, we deserve a chance to, to make a choice uh, about whether this is right. actually sensible. Right. So, you know, the folks watching this, if uh, if none of this scares you, well, then vote Republican. They're all for deregulation, yeah. you know. Yeah. But if you want to regulate and, uh, and start to find out about some of this stuff, uh, you need to think seriously about going to to uh, to Clearwater dot clearwaterportland.org and sign on to getting your signatures and, and so we can get this up onto the ballot in uh, May of 2014 and, uh, and make a decision. You know, we're going to have to make a decision. Uh, we don't have to make that decision now. We just need to get it up on the ballot. And exactly. then we, we got 14 months for interviewing great folks like this, like Howard here and Bill was just on, and, and people all over the city, they're going to be coming on to public access and trying to, to uh, give the other half of what you're going to be getting superficially from the corporate media and from exactly. these 70 companies, I think, that are 70 uh, organizations that are trying to get this foisted upon you. I want to mention that there is a benefit concert for the referendum on oh, October 7th with right. the Dandy Warhols and the Portland Cello Project uh, that people should go to. Right. I don't know where it is. But I'll have one more program before then. I'll make sure Excellent. to get that up. We got yeah. about uh, about 30 seconds here. I want to thank you very much. Oh, my pleasure. It was great. Uh, we could go on and on. It might have got a little wonky at times, but this, I tried to, to you, stay you, as, you did keep it down yeah. really well because, you know, you could go off into the stratosphere yes. with your with your bioaccumulation and all that. But those are important things to know about. Well, the thing is, people want to know that the science is good, but Shut, shut down to the science when it gets into too much detail. Too so much it's detail. Hard to find <laughs> yeah, the right yeah, level yeah. there. But, but especially for a whole bunch of different people. Exactly. All right. I want to thank folks for tuning in. We're down to just a few seconds. Uh, we've had some good information, and we hope you can put it to use, and we'll see you next week.